So properties were read. We judged that the land was so badly damaged it was unlikely that it could be rebuilt on within a reasonable period of time. So it was, and also the fixing of it was going to take time. It was going to be uncertain how long that was going to be, but it was going to be years. It wasn't going to be cost effective. But also we felt that give people that sort of uncertainty to say your, all your houses were coming down. You couldn't move back onto that land for a period of time, perhaps two, three, four, five years, simply wasn't going to be reasonable for people in those red zones. But fundamentally it had to have all those four characteristics. The green, which is obviously the vast majority, 180,000, it's about the fact that the land can be rebuilt on an individual basis. So those red properties, it could have been rebuilt on, but you couldn't rebuild the properties on that land without doing an area-wide fix of that land. The green land, by definition, it can be done by individual property owners working with their insurance companies, fixing their individual bits of land. So it's about you working with your individual insurance company or with EQC to be able to move ahead. Um, in making that land assessment, we used, there were, there were two general bits of work that was done. The first was the LIDAR. So LIDAR is when you fly over an area in an aeroplane with a really fancy sort of camera, which actually me measures the, la the, the ground level very accurately using lasers. And that information is then compared with the, li the last time a, li a LIDAR flight was taken over the city, and they compare the land levels, and from there they work out whether the, whether the land has dropped. So the issue for a lot of Christchurch, especially that eastern part of Christchurch, has been the liquefaction has come up through the ground, and as a result the ground has dropped as that, as that, as that silt, silty material has come out. The second issue has been lateral spreading, and lateral spreading is literally when the land flows towards a river. And that's been observed through cracking, um, um, through looking at what's happened on the roads and those sorts of things. In making these land decisions, we wanted to try and do it in a way that gave everybody um, as much confidence what we're doing and allow people to move forward. We've done it in as robust way as possible. There's always been the discussion about how quickly we could have done it. Um, but there's always going to be a balance between doing it to an absolutely minute level of detail and taking five or ten years to get there and doing it to an extent that we think is actually gives that reasonable balance between timeliness, um, timeliness and accuracy. So we're next going to hear from the people from DBH who are going to talk about the building stuff um, in terms of the building, the building levels needed. Um, but we're also doing quite a lot of work with GNS just to understand about what level of shaking we can expect in Christchurch going forward because of course that forms part of the decision making process. But really from here you all need to be working with your insurers and your and EQC um, to consider how you, how you move ahead here. So I've just got, some, just got some pretty pictures here showing the level of liquefaction. So this first one here is the liquefaction in Christchurch after September the 4th. You're going to see the difference between um, September and February. So in, in, in September it was pretty much just concentrate around those river areas, you can see in February it became very, very large areas of the city. So this is a, this is a, this is a TC1, TC2 and TC3 um, boundaries that Mike talked about. Um, so the blue is a TC3, um, the red is obviously the, the areas that have gone red, the orange is the, or, are the remaining orange areas, the yellow are the TC2 areas and the grey is the TC1 areas. So maybe the, I'll hand over now to Peter Sparrow, because Peter's from DBH and he's just going to talk about what these, what these foundation designs and so on mean for you. Thank you, Peter. Right, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. My name's Peter Sparrow, I'm with the Department of Building and Housing. Um, the Department of Building and Housing deals with, it regulates buildings and construction in New Zealand, so it deals with things like building law, um, the technical standards for things to comply with, the building code. So what we're going to talk about a little bit now is the um, new, new foundation design categories that, are, uh, that we've put out in Canterbury. So about the green zone, hey, nothing, we know the ground has changed, you've all experienced it. Since the first earthquake in September 4th, Roger showed you the details there with some liquefaction, there's been extensive scientific and geotechnical research undertaken. And, this is, and the information known to us has increased every time there's been an event. Now, not to say the land in the green zone is still considered 
able to be built on. It is considered able to be built on. Some of those areas, however, will require some more robust foundations. So the technical categories that you've been hearing about, we call them TC1, TC2 and TC3. But they're technical categories 1, 2 and 3, quite simply. The technical categories describe how the land is expected to perform in future earthquakes. Technical categories only apply to homes in the flat in the residential green zone. They don't apply to businesses, but they do apply to building extensions if you're adding to your house. Technical category one. In technical category one, you're un it's unlikely to experience significant land damage from liquefaction in future earthquakes. We can put down standard foundations that we use on a day-to-day -day basis all over New Zealand. However, we did make a change. We, we've now required concrete foundations and slabs to be tied with steel, steel reinforcing. We can't use unreinforced slabs anymore. And that's countrywide now. That's the whole of New Zealand, not just Canterbury. Technical category two. It's expected that potentially we could get moderate to, um, sorry, minor to moderate land damage from liquefaction in future events. What you can do in this particular category is standard timber piled foundations with lightweight cladding, that's your timber weatherboards and you know, long run iron roofs. If you want that heavy cladding like brick veneers and concrete tile roofs, sorry, the last one was actually iron roof, if you want a heavy cladding like brick veneer or concrete tile roofs, then you can use the robust foundations that we developed in our guidance from December. Now the technical category that you're probably here to listen to is technical category three of the green zone. It's expected that moderate to significant land damage may result from liquefaction in future events. There is no one size fits all solution for this particular area, this particular um, category. It's subject to site specific geotechnical investigation and site specific design. Now that may sound scary to some of you, but can I just make it really clear these types of foundations are designed on a day-to-day -day basis throughout New Zealand. Not just in Canterbury, they design them from far north all the way down to Invercargill. It can be done. So what does this mean for you? Look, homeowners in TC1 and TC2, carry on. You can carry on your construction and your repairs. In relation to TC3 or Technical Category 3 foundations, you can still proceed with that as well with specific geotechnical design and specific engineering design. Like I said, we do it on a day-to-day -day basis. Now in TC3, you've heard this, heard this terminology of deep pile foundations. That may not actually be required. If you get a geotechnical assessment in TC3, because of the extent of geotechnical assessments that's been done to categorise the land, you may actually find that the geotechnical engineer may say the land is the equivalent to TC2. That could be an outcome from the geotechnical assessment. Now we're conducting foundation research at the moment and you would have all heard about the research we've been doing out at QE2 Park. And that's where we've developed some foundations, we've set, up, set off explosives to simulate liquefaction. Um, we're currently compiling that information to see if we can provide a solution in the future for those people in technical category three. So just to summarise, a summary of department's guidance is available at the back. You can also get it online at www.dbh.government.nz. Again, the result of the research that we're doing out at QE2 Park will be available as soon as possible. If you are unsure of what 
technical category your land is, it is available on landcheck.org.nz. Please go and have a look. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Patrick Schofield. I'm the uh, Building Policy and Consents Manager with Christchurch City Council. And this presentation only goes only brief, um, doesn't go very long. Just to explain uh, the requirements for a building consent, uh, you'll still need a building consent. Uh, we know that uh, when your insurance payments, your land assessments, foundation design, etc., are sorted out, then you'll need to put in a building consent. And we do realise that there'll be a large number of consents all coming in at the same time. And we're trying to employ staff to be able to cope with that. So we're trying not to be a, be a problem. So we want to support you with the consent process. Our job is to help make sure that your home renovations and building rebuilds meet the building standards. And uh, we're gearing up at Council to make sure, as I've said, that the consent process is streamlined and as uh, speedy as possible. Um, we're leading the country in um, consent processing, especially electronic uh, consenting, which has allowed us, after the February event, to get back online and, and start processing again from various parts of the city. This uh, might be a little bit difficult to read, but it's a little bit of a snakes and ladders game taken from a Department of Building and Housing publication. And it's a step one to step 14 process of a resource and building consent process. It just goes over the, the basic steps. Project management officers, some of you, you can either put in your building consent directly as the owner or your owner's agent, your designer, architect. You can, um, go via your insurance company and uh, use a PMO, and that's project management officers, or if you're under the $100,000 cap, EQC will have PMOs, and um, they are generally using Fletchers, you would have heard about that. We have uh, two systems set up in council. We have the normal building consent process, and we've set up a, a special office called Earthquake Consenting to assist if you're going via a PMO to help speed up that process. New foundation designs. We're working with the DBH to understand what the new foundation designs will mean and for your consenting. TC1 is a green grey, and that's uh, New Zealand 3604 foundation design, which is a, a standard foundation design. TC2 is a green yellow, and now you've also got a green blue. So the green uh, yellow zone, the TC2, that's using the DBH guidance document or other engineer specific design foundations. And the green blue is the one that um, people have the most difficulty with, that specific engineer design. So there's a little bit more work involved in that. Land information memorandums, this is a question we've been asked. Uh, will the information be on your limb? And the answer is yes. Uh, the technical categories will be on your limb. What will be in a PIM? A PIM is a project information memorandum. So you apply for that or sometimes you don't have to apply for it, but quite a lot of people do, to get information on their property. Not only these technical categories one, two and three, but there's a whole range of other things that could be on your land, uh, flood zones, etc. A lot of you would have got that information already. Hi, I'm Reid Stiven from EQC. I'm the Canterbury Event Manager. So we just want to give you a, an update on for those of you that were within the EQC PMO or Fletcher PMO, what the categories mean to you. So in respect to foundations, um, they are covered under your building cover with EQC. They do not form part of your land cover. So any claim, what, very simply that means any claim for foundation upgrade will be part of your dwelling cover and not your land. Land will be dealt with separately. In terms of your building, we cover the damage to the building up to the $100,000 limit per event. And if that means you're within our PMO, EQC will pay for the foundation upgrade. However, in many instances, the amount of damage across the whole house will take it over cap. And at that point in time, we will pay, we'll settle the claim at cap, and you will then deal with your insurers. One of, the, one of the things we are really positive about is there are a number of houses that don't actually have foundation repair, so they will not be subject to any of the technical categories, and we can continue with Fletchers to repair those homes at the moment. Uh, the categories for TC1, 2 and 3 were determined by Sarah and DBH and do not relate to your EQC assessment. 
So if you're TC3 or blue, it may mean in time that we will need to complete another dam uh, inspection of your house just to ascertain what level of improvement to those foundations is required. In respect of your land, EQC covers uh, land to bring it back to its September 4 standard. So in essence, we'll bring your land back up to, the, to its condition pre-September 4. That's the land under your building platform and pertinent structures around your home, which will include your dwelling, your garden shed and the like, and the eight metres of surrounds around those. We also cover your access way within 60 metres of the dwelling, and that's as the crow flies, so it actually may extend past 60 metres if you're in a more rural, rural location. We also cover retaining walls, retaining walls that are within eight metres of your dwelling, or support land that supports the dwelling, or support and protect the access way. For those of you that have very minor damage to your land, it is likely that we may deal directly with you and settle that claim by way of a cash payment. Um, if the land damage is more significant, we would use the Fletcher's project management team to repair the land. But we're very keen that we do this um, at once. We don't want to be coming back to your property to repair your home and then come back and repair your land. It will all be done at the same time. If you uh, choose to opt out of the Fletcher program, uh, then if obviously we'll, you, we would expect that you will manage your own land reinstatement as well. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Dean McGregor. I'm from IAG. Um, if you've purchased insurances through State, NZI or through one of our banking partners, ASB, BNZ um, or PSIS, then it's likely you'll be insured with us. So I don't have a formal presentation, but I think there's probably a couple of key points that you probably have questions on your mind around. Um, but I'll start off by just saying, you know, our general approach is, um, is usually to follow EQC. So Initially, everybody had to lodge a claim with EQC, either for your property, as in your house um, contents, or also your land. So we are very um, aware of the fact that um, you know people are looking to make progress as quickly as possible, as as we are. So we we have lodged that claim with EQC, um, and they have clearly identified that your claim goes over the EQC cap. Um, or in case where you had multiple damage from different events that goes over the cap for, for each of those, then you should have your claim with us. We, um, if we haven't already completed a preliminary assessment, um, then you should be following us up for that, um, because in all cases we believe we've done the majority of preliminary assessments. The next stage is then, you know, how do we respond to these um, technical categories in the green zone? So, I think the good news on that is um, technical category one, um, in most cases there will be minimal or no land damage and that gives us um, the ability to get on and start working with you on those properties. If it's technical category two and the Department of Building and Housing guidelines apply, then we just need to make sure that if there is any land damage, as, as Reid talked about, that that is dealt with if it's going to impact um, you know, getting the house um, repaired at the same time. Technical category three, um, and I'm only speaking on behalf of IAG here, but we are very interested in following um, the work that is being done on the uh, de department of, not the, uh, sorry, the, um, the potential uh, foundation um, uh, investigations that are being carried out at QE2 at the moment, because it does present some opportunities to do things um, in a better way. So we want to make sure that whatever it is that is put back into your home at the end is, you know, is the right design um, for your property. So, so our general approach will be to see you know, how those investigations come out, um, but we'll be working with you on an individual basis through that using geotechnical engineers at the same time. So um, I think they're the key things. The other big question probably that, that most people have asked is, if my house does require these upgraded foundations, then does the insurance pay for it? So the answer to that in general is yes. Um, the IAG policies do respond to increased cost of compliance. So if in order to get a consent to repair your home, um, you required these increased foundation designs, then yes, we would cover that. The only thing that we do say is that under our policies, it, um, they do respond only to the parts of the property that have sustained damage. Um, so we understand from um, the Christchurch City Council though that they would only require these upgraded foundations if the foundation itself was damaged to the extent that it needed to a new consent for those foundations. So, um, so in that respect we believe that you know, if it's required then yes um, our insurance policies will meet that cost. Thank you. Um, my name's Jason Donnelly, I'm from Tower Insurance, uh, which covers Fintel. 
as well. Um, as Dean said, you know, tail policies are really the same, um, that we will have to comply with any council regulations. So if foundations do need to be upgraded, um, then again, you know, we'll work with customers and with EQC for the land to ensure um, that we comply with that regulation. So um, there's no problem with that at all. So again, you know, at TC1, we're, we're keen to sort of like move ahead and get repairs done as quickly as possible. We're already doing some repairs. Um, TC3, you know, we're just at the moment waiting for sort of um, the solution that the um, department, department of building come up with for the foundations, but we're keen to move forward as soon as possible. Thank you. Peter Rose from AMI. I'll make a few comments and uh, the other guys might do the same and then we'll just wait for questions afterwards. So what the gents have said tonight uh, is pretty much in accord with where AMI is. TC1 and TC2 are right to go in terms of moving forward with, um, with your insurance decisions and moving into design and uh, arranging for, for building to occur. Uh, TC3 is not right to go yet, not until EQC has completed its assessments it's, and then completed its remediation plans and, if necessary, undertaken the remediation. Um, so they'll have to be delayed. And from what we hear from, uh, from DBH, uh, the, the, the specific uh, foundation design requirements uh, may not be known done, until early in the new year. So uh, from the point of view of 2C3, we won't be building until, I guess you might say, well in, into the new year. But you can proceed. You can proceed, say, in terms of AMI's policy, we have four options. You can proceed to decide which of the four options you want, uh, whether you want to buy another house, you want to rebuild on the same site, rebuild an, on another site, or take a cash settlement. What we've found is that a lot of people have, um, who have received our offers uh, have declined to move forward at this point of time. We did a survey of, um, of about 120 of those, and a significant uh, percentage of the reason for it, this is a few weeks ago, was, was awaiting for the land decisions. Well, of course, the land decisions are made now, so our recommendation is you, you do move forward and look towards at least kicking the process off, even if uh, building can't, uh, can't start at this point of time. Uh, you can certainly come up with the design of the superstructure of the place. You can decide whether you want to do uh, any additional works that aren't going to be part of the insurance payout, like uh, we, we call uninsured works, if you happen to have some extra cash and you want to uh, put on another room or some such, you can, you can go through your planning and through, uh, of that. So we recommend that you don't wait, that you, you do move forward with at least your preliminary decision in terms of the direction you want to, uh, you want to go, go, go in. And uh, I think a, a, another good reason why you, sh you, sh you shouldn't be delaying, firstly, if you want to buy another house, the housing stocks are likely to dry up in the future. So first, first in best dress in that, in that sense. And also, if you're looking towards uh, rebuilding, you want to get onto the um, onto the great onto the train uh, conveyor belt as soon as you can, because it's quite possible that uh, building resources and you know, people to, to do the building uh, might dry up uh, before you get to it. So, our recommendation is you do move forward. You don't just sit on your hands at this point of time, waiting for all the final decisions to be taken. I'm attending a whole number of community briefings um, to the recently released technical categories in the green zone. And I wanted to give you a personal comment what they relate to and a quick analogy uh, using my jacket. Now, uh, the technical categories one to three relate to the performance of the land and especially the future performance um, concerning rebuild. Now, if we're talking technical category one, it means very simply investigation using scala penetrometer, which is a rod being hammered in the ground to check the bearing capacity of the soil. And one can use a standard foundation design as per the New Zealand building code. The technical category two involves a very similar uh, investigation technique where a 
rot is being hammered into the ground and based on the strength of the ground a foundation type can be selected which um, has been published in the Department of Building and Housing uh, um, cheat sheet. So you can see there's either a waffle slab, a thick slab or a piled foundation. Now technical category three, we need to engage a geotechnical engineer and the geotechnical engineer needs to undertake either cone penetrometer test or borings or other types of sounding to determine what the makeup up of the land is down to 15, 20 meters to understand how the building will behave in a future event. And based on that, they will then do a specific foundation design. Now that sounds all very complicated, but I just want to go back a step and say, look, if you go and buy a jacket, you can go to the internet and order a jacket. And if you're the type, which is the standard form, you order the jacket, size 48, you've delivered, you put it on, it's all fine. That's technical category one. Technical category two, you have to go to a shop and try two or three jackets on till you find the right one. That's technical category two. Now technical category three, if you're slightly around the bugger like myself and an odd shaped or have uh, one longer arm than the other, then you have to go to the tailor. If you go to the tailor and they will measure you up and custom make a jacket for you like the one I'm holding in my hand. And that's simply what technical categories relate to. How the land will perform and whether you need a custom made fit or can take a tailor made solution or you can actually get something off the rack. Simple.